We're going to be starting in Romans chapter 5, but I want to another little tidbit of information for as a side note here that I learned this week. Before we get started, turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 2 says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Amen. Um, does anybody happen to know where that is written in the prophets? <laughs> it's not. It's in Malachi. Amen. Malachi chapter three, verse one says, "Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come with his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight. And behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts." The point I want to get at is. All modern translations have Mark 1 2 wrong. They say, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, or some variation of that. Mm -hmm. In fact, the New King James is the only modern one that doesn't say that. Even the, going back to the Latin Vulgate, which the Catholic Bible is based on, it says the same thing. Right. So people want to say that all. These modern translations are okay, but besides the other many errors, there's one that's blatantly, obviously wrong. Amen. Can't even name the right prophet. But just some information for y'all, and y'all think on it. If someone wants to say, well, the ESV is just as good as the King James, it's, it has its faults. Amen. Really, everything is translated from the Anything besides what we call the received text, the text is receptive, says that error in it. Amen. So let's go to Romans chapter 5 and we'll get our, begin on our study in here in Romans. Of, here are chapter 5. We begin with the results or the fruits of being justified through Christ. And we'll, a large portion of the chapter is dealing with what Christ has done for us. And kind of in the middle of that, Paul brings out what we sometimes call the doctrine of original sin, or how the sin came to the world through Adam. He contrasts that with what Christ has done for us. Here he starts chapter 5, verse 1. We'll look at verse 1 and 2, Lord willing. He says, Therefore, being justified by the faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. It says, therefore, be justified by faith. We, I think we established very thoroughly in chapter 4 that we are justified by faith without works. Mm -hmm. Using Abraham as the example, Paul goes into great detail about how justification comes through faith alone. Mm -hmm. So he's building upon that argument here in the beginning of chapter 5 and tells us, therefore, being justified by faith. Because we've been justified by faith, because it's not of our own merit, it's not of our own works, he said, we, because of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think we sometimes understand the significance of that phrase that we have peace with God. You know, certainly we have peace with men that comes as a result of salvation, but this is referring to our relationship with God himself, that we have Amen. peace with him. You know, before we were saved, we were at enmity with God. We That's were right. transgressors of His law. We were breakers of His commandments. We were sinners in the sight of a holy and righteous God. And yet now, through faith in Christ, we have peace with Him. Mm -hmm. so that is why we can say later on in the book of Romans, if God be for us, who can be against us? Mm -hmm. We have this peace. We have this harmony, if you will. This state of being at rest with God. You know, the two warring nations, oftentimes they come to a peace treaty at the end. And that's a similar type of thing that we have here. We were warring against God, in a sense, and yet now we have peace with Him. Amen. The difference is God will never break that 
peace. The nations of this world often break their peace treaties. The leaderships and governments change. And that's why we fought Germany more than once in World War. Right. You know what? Japan, Imperial Japan was a great enemy in World War II. And with the atomic bomb, we humbled them pretty quickly as a right. nation, but now we have peace with them. You bet. But even on a greater scale, we were the enemy of God. Now we have peace with Him through the person of Christ. You know, it's not something we can get on our own merit. No, this, like I said, this peace implies a rest with God, that we are no longer striving and warring against God and His Word. We are no longer under His wrath and condemnation. And in that state of, we have this peace that we can really be reconciled to God as he'll bring out later in the chapter. Mm -hmm. well, he says, and it, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that means this is the only way to have peace with God. It's not, there's nothing we can do in our own doings. We cannot go to God on our own merit and seek peace with him. Right. He said we were sinners in the sight of God before. We really had no nothing we could offer God to, that he should choose to have peace with us. Right. You know, you know, like we had dropped that bomb on Japan even more so, God would be just if he had just dropped his whole wrath upon us, wouldn't he? You're yeah. right. Yet he did that on our behalf to the person of Christ. Do we, there's no amount of good works, nor is there any ritual that we can do to earn this peace. Right. So it can't come through anyone besides our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Buddha cannot offer peace with God. Muhammad cannot offer peace with God. Despite what the Catholics say, Mary cannot offer peace with God. Yeah. Yeah. The pastor or priest or so on, your parents, any, there's no one but our Lord Jesus Christ that can bring about this state of peace in the sight of God. Amen. Well, if you were unsaved this morning, you were still at a, in a state of enmity against him. That's, knowing what I know about God, that's not a place I would want to be. Amen. And one day, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you'll stand before him, still fully against God and his word, and and you will have the full wrath of God to try it upon you. But yet, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have peace with God. Because he suffered the wrath of God for us. Or Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Mm -hmm. We don't have to turn there, but Ephesians 2, verse 13 and 14 tell us that he is our peace. That he destroyed the enmity that was between us and God. Christ was the only one that can bring about this peace with God. And mm -hmm. Yet there's so many today that trust in other things. So I think sometimes we don't think too often about what this means to have peace with God. Right. But it's a great blessing and privilege as a child of God that we have peace with our God. That we're no longer against him and his word. We're no longer an enmity against him. We're no longer in the sight of God through Christ. We're no longer sinners and lawbreakers. I know in this flesh we struggle with things, but through the person of Christ, he doesn't see us in that light anymore. Amen. Let's go on to verse 2 here. He says, By whom also... That is, through the person of Christ, of whom also we have access by faith into this grace. This access by faith is, without faith in Christ, we would not have access to God, nor any of the blessings that follow salvation. And John 14, 6 tells us that, no man comes unto the Father but by me. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 18 tells us that it's by him that we have access to the Father. We can 
I think we all know probably Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that by him or through Christ we have access into the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. Yet we don't have that access apart from faith in Christ. That's why I don't, I know their understanding has not been opened, but I don't understand how so many people can trust in all these other things but Christ. Right. Even those who call themselves Christians, they want to trust in works and good deeds and rituals or these quote prayers that they've said or some trust in the Pope and some trust in their pastor or some trust in Mary yet they all call themselves Christians and yet right. they have faith in Christ and that's as we've seen all through chapter 4 and as we see now faith is the key to really everything that comes to us through or by God through Christ. Amen. Without faith in Christ, we are we can we have no right to call ourselves a Christian. We have no right to call ourselves saved. No, we have he said we have access by faith through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he is our mediator, first John tells us. Amen. It's by him that we have this access to God. If you recall in the Old Testament, they didn't have that free access like we do. Certainly they could pray to God. <coughs> Certainly they think the Spirit came unto them. I don't know if they had a permanent and willing the Spirit like we do. Right. In fact, the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, it says, and an evil spirit came upon him. That's it. David prayed that the Lord would not take away his spirit from him, the Holy Spirit, that is. And they had to go and go before the priest and wash and offer their sacrifices, and only the priest could go into the presence of God. And mm -hmm. Only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies. Right. And yet, through the person of Christ, we have access, as we said in Hebrews, directly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy. And find grace and help in time of need. That's a privilege that we don't often take advantage of, I think. Mm -hmm. We try to do things in our own strength, in our own power, or, yet we have full access to the throne of the Almighty, and really access into all the grace that he offers, mm -hmm. all the grace that he has for us, and yet, we would rather trust in man and ourselves. He says, we have access by faith into this grace wherein you stand. Certainly, grace starts at salvation, but it doesn't stop there. We now, because of Christ, are in a state of favor in the sight of God. Amen. So again, not because of anything we did, or it wouldn't be grace, would it? And we have this unmerited favor, as it's called, because of Christ. And we stand completely without any enmity. We stand completely, as we saw in verse 1, with, with peace before God. But it doesn't just end there with peace before God. That would certainly be enough in this life, wouldn't it? Amen. Just, to have, just to have peace with God, just know that one day we'll stand before him, not condemned. Yet he, his grace extends much farther than just our initial salvation, doesn't it? He gives us also peace in this life, or he can. So he also gives us grace to withstand trials and tribulations. He extends mercies and grace in many different situations. And he says, by faith in Christ, we have access to this grace. Amen. But when we don't seek it by faith, we're not going to have access to it. We must believe that God is able, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, what Hebrews 11 tells us. So it's more than just saving grace, it's Really, any of the good which we receive from God is of His grace. 
here it says this this grace wherein you stand or wherein we stand to stand here means the cause to stand or establish we're not standing in our own strength but we're standing by the grace of god amen uh, i think that's why first corinthians 10 12 tells us let him that think he stand take heed lest he fall mm -hmm. if we're trying to stand on our own we will certainly fall really, i think it was like those pink or spurgeon once said that no man stands any longer than god holds him up mm -hmm. so you had that without the grace of God, we would not be able to stand on our own. But this grace here is what has established us. It's what causes us to stand. That's, again, one of the problems with works-based salvation and works-based perseverance is that it looks at man and what man is doing or what man has done rather than looking at what Christ has accomplished for us. Really, the fact is, man cannot stand himself up or stand on his own strength. Amen. Well, it's like a, like I said, we're spiritually dead without outside of Christ. <clears throat> I've never yet seen a dead man stand up on his own. Right. Even if I go there, prop his body up, just the slightest thing will knock him over, and he won't be able to stand on his own either. Amen. We're no different outside of Christ. We will fall. We will not be able to stand. And when you stand before God, you will have nothing to stand on either. He says, he goes on to say in the last part of that, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This word rejoice can mean to boast, and this here means to boast in a good sense. It's often translated to glory in something or someone. The glory in God or glory in our Lord or the glory in His grace. Really, it's to say, look at God and what He has done, instead of saying, look at me and what I have accomplished. That's what rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God is. We have a great cause to rejoice as the people of God. We get Amen. Oftentimes we sit around like a bump on a log, you know saying, or as Brother Richard say, with faces long enough to drink, let her look out of a churn. Right. I know happiness and rejoicing aren't exactly the same thing, but yet we can have both in the person of Christ. Amen. I think oftentimes we we look around at the world rather than looking at Christ. You know, a good metaphor of that is when Peter went to walk on the water. He was good while he was looking at Christ, but when he looked at the winds boisterous, it says he began to sink. Right. We do the same type of thing, though, don't we? Yeah. As long as we are fixed on Christ, there's really nothing we can't do spiritually. Yeah. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You no, know, that doesn't mean... I can win a football game through Christ, but in the service of Christ, we can do all things through Him. Yet, oftentimes, though, don't we, we look out at the world and all the trouble that's going on out there, maybe problems we have in our own life, and we say, well, I just can't do it. Hmm. So, when we look to God through Christ, we have much that we can rejoice in, though. Amen. It says, Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And if you re recall from the last chapter, we looked at hope in the life of Abraham, how he against so believed in hope, it says. That really, we can have that same type of hope that no matter what may be in the way, that God is able to fulfill his promises. And we have a we have a hope that one day we will experience the full glory of God. Amen. We great hope for the child of God is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 tells us that we're looking for that glory today in the great appearing of our Savior, or our God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's so much that comes along with that that we oftentimes don't think of, do we? 
when he returns, it will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, we'll put on incorruption and this mortal, put on immortality, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. We shall have a body like in his glorious body. Besides that, though, then we'll be ushered in the presence of God for all of eternity. None of us in this flesh have experienced the full glory of God. That's right. Yet one day we will. That is a great hope for the child of God. Mm -hmm. Close as anyone got with Moses there on the mountain. When you just saw the backside and even then he was covered up. Just that little glimpse is still nothing compared to when we stand before him in all of his glory. Mm -hmm. We can see a lot of that in Romans chapter 8. How the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. We have a great hope of this glory of God, as he calls it here. We have hope outside of this life. That's what we looked at last week about the resurrection. It gives us hope in Christ more than just this life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other religions of the world can't offer that. You know, the Islams or, or Mohammedans, that's some people used to call them, they don't have hope in Muhammad of eternal life. You know, they have, their God promises them some sort of eternal life if they're doing enough good works or right, what they call good works. The Buddha cannot offer hope of eternal life or hope of being in the full glory of God. Even many forms of Christianity can't offer that. Amen. At best, some of them offer hope so of salvation, but not real hope that is called steadfast and sure, as the scripture calls it. Mm -hmm. you know, we have this <laughs> great hope for the person of our Lord Jesus Christ because he defeated not only sin, and, but also death, hell, and the grave. You know, their Savior, quote unquote, can offer that, can they? Amen. Well, one day we will be raised, we'll, whether we're here or in the ground, we'll be called to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. First Thessalonians tells us that should give us great hope that this world is not all that there is. Amen. We can we can look out and we can see the economic and political problems in our country and really throughout the whole world. We can see uh, sin is accepted and pushed more and more. And we can look out and see the wars and rumors of wars, as the scripture calls it. I know a lot of people are worried about World War III and nuclear destruction. We go to war with it. Russia or North Korea, or even China, and yet none of that really matters a whole lot when we consider that we have hope of the glory of God. Hope Amen. Beyond this life. That's it. You know, if nuclear destruction came to America, then that would just usher us in the presence of God even faster. You know, America that falls off to be a third world country. But even that will matter very little when we get to eternity. Amen. We have a great cause to rejoice as the people of God because we have justification through Christ, because we have peace with God, and even more so we have access into this, the full grace of God. And then we, on top of all that, we have hope the glory which awaits us, the hope that we'll see God in all his glory one day. Right. Even Job had that hope, didn't he? He might have. He said, when worms my body is destroyed, he said, yet in my flesh will I see God. And we have that same hope that Job had. Us. Yet in our flesh we shall see God in all Amen. his glory. And we ought to rejoice in that hope. Mm -hmm. but if you 
Farm saved, you can't have that hope. It only comes through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why works based salvation, they don't offer real hope. That's it. Trusting in Christ. You know, salvation is based on the church or the Pope or whatever else, or it comes through other means such as Mary or Muhammad, they can't offer the same hope. But I just urge you to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you too can be partaker of all these blessings that come through him. The Lord willing, we'll look at some of the things that we have to, to expect in this life. Tribulation, but also from tribulation come with patience and patience experience and experience hope, he says. Right. And hope make it not ashamed. We're going to look at that next week. We're going to close with that thought today. Amen. Amen.